grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text is the epistle, very encouraging text. I will just reread it. But we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thus far our text. We are living in very discouraging times. We're in the midst of a pandemic where people are afraid of the disease. We are living in national election times of great trouble. And we could go on and on and on about all the troubles of life. But Job says they're nothing new. For man born of woman is full of trouble. We're living in a fallen world, remember? Adam and Eve, our first parents, rebelled against the God who made them and fell into what is known as rebellion against God, and we have inherited it. And we live in it. So Paul writes encouraging words for a discouraging world. He gives us three points. We have a problem. God has a solution. Therefore, comfort one another. You see, the Thessalonians... This was a mission church, as most of them were, that Paul dealt with. These people were coming out of deep, dark unbelief. They didn't know squat about Christ, life, salvation, the creation, why we're here, where we're going. So Paul comes to them with the good news. And they come to faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they learn that God himself came from heaven to bear our sins, pay their debt, that they might have forgiveness and the certain hope of eternal life. But coming out of unbelief and being surrounded by heathens, they had trouble sorting this all out and knowing what happens to the dead. So they had false thoughts. They had phony theology about the dead and the resurrection. That's why Paul writes, and in the Greek, it's really unknowing. I don't want you to be unknowing. I want you to know these things. God wants us to know these things. That's why you study the scriptures, because in the scriptures, he teaches us these things. They thought that Christ was going to come any moment. So they were going to be ready for him. But they were concerned about their loved ones who had died. They thought since they had died before he returned, that they were done, they were out of it. They weren't going to get to go to heaven. Uh, they didn't know what in the world they were going to do. They were just going to stay on the ground forever. 
So they had false thoughts, and it was causing them great trouble. It was disturbing their hearts, minds, and their souls. And that's what false theology does to you. You don't know the truth about God, so you're all confused. How many times have we heard it said, when mother dies, oh, I bet she's in heaven now looking down upon us. My sister thinks that way. I've heard her say that numerous times. That's just one of my sisters. Confusing thoughts. Mother is not looking down upon us, and she's not either smiling or crying or laughing or whatever. There's a great gulf, Jesus says, between heaven and earth. So erase that thought. Mother's in heaven singing with the saints to her Savior, and she's very, very happy. So they had false thoughts. They had false thinking, false ideas. And so do some people today in this world. God doesn't want us to have false thoughts. He wants us to know the truth. It boggles my mind why people enjoy living a lie. That's crazy. We need to know the truth about life. And then we are comforted. Paul says about life and death, and he emphasizes this too, and you can kind of read, read by it quickly and on. He says, from the Lord. Look, people, I got this directly from Christ, our Savior. After he knocked me off my horse on my way to Antioch to drag Christians out of their houses and possibly kill some of them, he told me to go into the desert of Arabia, and there he taught me directly for three years. So he's emphasizing to them, this is not my goofy thought. This has come from Christ himself, the God who created us. said, I don't want you to be ignorant about the dead. When Jesus returns, the dead are going to be raised first. So there, be comforted. The dead are also going to heaven, those who believe in Christ. said, the dead are going to be raised first. And then we will... Those of us who are still living, Christians, will be gathered together with our Lord. We all, everyone in the world, living and dead, will hear the voice of Christ when he returns. He is going to descend from heaven. You will hear his voice. You will hear the trumpets blowing. And the psalmist says, don't run and hide like the unbelievers, but lift up your heads, O ye gates, and joyfully look forward to when your Savior is coming for you. That's going to be a great day. What a day it's going to be for the Christian church when Christ returns and takes us all to heaven with him. He said, we'll see him coming down. And then the dead are going to be raised. Now, Paul doesn't go into this, but this is other places in Scripture. When you die, your soul goes to heaven immediately. And this is why Jesus says, he who believes in me, though he dies, shall live. Sounds like a contradiction. But your soul is immortal. It will never die. So when you think you're dying, your soul's going to go right to heaven. And your body is going to go back to the earth where Paul says a couple of times in this text, it will be sleeping. Now he doesn't talk about the soul sleeping. That's a false theology which some people hang on to. 
No, your soul goes to heaven. Last Sunday in our Revelation text, we heard about where the souls are now. They're in heaven singing to their Savior. They're in great happiness awaiting the resurrection. So when Christ comes back, your soul and your body is going to be reunited. Now what are we going to be like? Hey, last Sunday in the epistle, John told us. He says, I don't know for sure what we're going to be like, but I do know our bodies, we are going to be like Christ. Yes, this body, which is decaying, getting older, is going to be made perfect like Christ's body. I used to encourage my father with this often. He lost his hand in a farming accident. And life on the farm with one hand is not easy. So I used to try and encourage him, Dad, when you get to heaven and in the resurrection, you're going to have your hands back. You'll be, your soul and body will be reunited and your body will be made perfect like Christ's body. God wants us to know this. He wants his church to know these things. He wants us to know about life and death. He wants us to know that he created us. He wants us to know we have purpose. And then when this life is over, he will lovingly take you to heaven to be with the saints and with him. Now Paul says, the last verse, comfort one another with these words. See, in this discouraging world, where you look around and see all the troubles of the world going on, don't let them bother you. Encourage one another with these words, parakaleto. That's the same word for the paraclete. The, and what do we call the paraclete? The Holy Spirit, the comforter. He's the comforter. God wants us to do the same with one another. Comfort one another with these good words, with this encouragement. As we heard again last week, don't worry about things. Now, I know that's easier for me to say than for you to do it. But Jesus tells us, don't worry. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Trust in him. Jesus is in heaven, ruling and reigning the entire universe. He is in charge. Not you. Not me, not anybody else. Jesus is in charge, and nothing happens without his approval. Now, bad things happen, I know it. He lets those bad things happen. But he also lets good things happen. And he tells you and me, he has your name, through holy baptism, written in the book of life. And nothing is going to change it. In baptism, he came into you, and this great mystery, you have studied this in Peter, you went into him. This is called the mystical union. You are very tightly united with your Savior. He's in you, and you are in him. Now he says, comfort one another with these words. Know that God is the creator. He created you. God is the redeemer. He redeemed you. With his very precious blood shed on the cross. And God is the sanctifier. He makes you holy through word and sacrament. And he wants you to know these things. God grant this to each and every one of us. Amen. Now may the peace that passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
Amen.